out there covering the Commodore Shane. Spent a good deal of time talking not only this Hawaii game, but the current state of the program under Clark Lee. I think uh, not only Vanderbilt fans, but the entire SEC, you really appreciate this conversation with Chris Lee. Well, we're pleased to once again be joined by Chris Lee, who does an outstanding job covering Vanderbilt for Vandy Sports. It's my go-to podcast and website for Vanderbilt information. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, always happy to join you. Thanks for having me. Hey, so obviously it's we got a big game here, week zero, Vanderbilt at Hawaii. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you, Chris, what were your thoughts on uh, Clark Lee coming out? I thought it was pretty bold, a lot of his comments here at, at SEC Media Days. And, you know, I, I, some of that's to, to be expected. You got to you got to build your program and have faith in what you're doing. But uh, I don't know, just what, what was your impressions of all that? Well, I mean, it certainly made them the butt of a lot of jokes, which they don't need at the moment. But I don't think that he meant it. Look, I, I don't think anybody expects him to start winning national championships anytime soon. And I think what he was trying to sell was the experience that the kids were going to come there. They were going to get a good degree. They're going to be treated well. And, and, oh, by the way, they plan to win a lot of football games, too. Now, that is going to be the hard part. But I, I think I know what he was getting at. Um, I don't know that obviously the headline writing went a little different, but, um, you know, and, and let's be honest too, right? This is a program that, that could use some expectations and some standards. I mean, they're in the 21 game SEC losing streak. So maybe that's not the the talking point you're right. Want right then, but I think it shows that they want to be competitive and, and Hey, the old adage of aim for the stars and hit the moon maybe applies there uh, in case, you know, in, in their case where, just going to some bowl games would be some progress. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you about from um, our experience down there at Media Days, getting to meet with Mike Wright, probably wasn't a surprise to you, uh, Chris, but he really was an outstanding representative. And, and I would go as far as to say he was the best player interview at the entire event, not just Vanderbilt, but the entire SEC. Does that come as a surprise to you or was that something you kind of expected? I'm not shocked. Mike's a, a bright kid. He's a charismatic kid. He's a kid who really wanted to come to Vandy for a while. In fact, he was a UCF commit, and then Vanderbilt offered him late in the process. He broke that commitment and, and came to Vanderbilt. No, I mean, I, I'm not surprised. Mike is a dynamic personality. And, and on the field, by the way, he's a 10, 800-meter guy, which is going to make him one of the faster quarterbacks in the league. So, yeah, that's the universal sentiment is that he really represented him very well at media day. Now, this may be a, a tough question for you to answer. It's probably better for Clark Lee, but I really want to know, because I've been impressed with their ability to recruit, um, you know, considering where they've been and lack of attendance and stuff, but they're still, you know, doing a good job on the recruiting trail. But do you think it's tougher right now for Vanderbilt to land a commitment or hold on to a commitment? Because it seems like once Vanderbilt yeah. has got a, their, you know, their grips on, on a prospect, the rest of the SEC – starts to take notice of that prospect. So what what do you think is tougher for Vanderbilt right now? Well, that's a great question. I mean, technically the answer is to, to land it because, I mean, I had a Vanderbilt coach years ago tell me, once you get a guy committed, you know, there's a good chance you're going to keep him because he's got to turn around and tell you no. But the, the dynamic there, Mike, and, and you know this, is Barton Simmons is part of their operations now. Barton is a name that people know because he's been so good as a recruiting analyst. And so – it's kind of like when Vanderbilt gets a commitment, it sort of sends out a bat signal. Hey, everybody take a look at this kid because th their recruiting ability. And I've, I've heard this has been a topic at coaching conventions. They're very well respected for the class they brought in and the ability to identify. So that's the challenge for them. And I'm sure at times they probably got to be strategic about offers because the longer you've got a kid committed, the more time that is for everyone else to study up. But I mean, I, I think I've been very impressed with their ability to identify talent based on the way I've seen it in practice in fall camp. And I'm, I'm sure it, it seems other schools have also taken notice. And, and where are we at uh, on campus with uh, all the $300 million renovations and everything? I know you, you kind of hit on this mm. recently on, on your Vandy Sports podcast. Can you give us the latest on on where that is? Yeah, from what I understand, they're, they're still raising money. But they plan to break ground, I think, as soon as the football season is over. That open end zone that you see 
is going to turn into what I think they have called the country's largest practice facility for basketball for men and women. That'll have some premium seating there. Uh, the closing zone of the stadium will be torn down. That'll may, be made into a football-only building. They'll do some other stuff across the street. They'll shut down Nesty, Jess Neely Drive, which is a street that runs right behind that closed end zone. So I think the progress is going to start after the football season. I think the completion date is around 2025, but certainly – that will be a – facelift's not even the right word. It'll be almost an overhaul of that stadium, which everybody knows they need. Yeah. Now, something else also you've talked about recently, you've credited Clark Lee for opening all a camp so you could kind of come through and, and see every practice and you can really get an idea of how far this program has come in a year's time. So, you know, what is what's just some of the standout observations that you've seen from uh, this training camp for Vanderbilt? Well, they had to get more athletic. I mean, Mike, if you want to talk about, let's be real about what he was taking over. And you tell me if you've ever heard of this. They didn't have anybody drafted last year, and they had two kids that got invited to camp. Uh, that that mm-hmm. is very non SEC like. And so right. they need to upgrade everything. Uh, they need to get more bodies in the trenches. Uh, and I think he addressed that in recruiting, although those kids are not the ready-made Alabama, Georgia, Florida kids where they're 290 to, to 310 and 320 and ready to plug in right away. The bigger thing, too, I think, was, or just as big with speed. They just have been so slow the last few years. You can tell that these last two recruiting classes, and by the way, let's give Derek Mason a little credit. The one that he assembled on his way out was a good class, and so those kids now are first and second year in the program. I think they play – faster than they did before. Uh, I think that they expect more of these kids in terms of strength and conditioning. I think you're seeing that a little bit too. Uh, there's a lot more discipline in the program. Just tweaks here and there, and not little ones, but big ones, I think are starting to show off. Now, does that translate to wins this year? I don't know. I, I think they could go three and nine and be a much, much better team, but you can see the talent is getting better than what it was. Yeah, and some of the position groups I know that you mentioned on your podcast, quarterback, running back, receiver, looking deeper, looking just like a, you know, much closer to in it. I don't want to say, a, um, you know, an Alabama or Georgia, that'd be ridiculous, but closer to, to closing the gap, maybe to a Missouri or South Carolina. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, and here's another good way to put it too, Mike. Last year, if you'd said, which kid on that team, name me some kids that are going to be in NFL draft picks. I would have just thrown up my hands and said, well, I, I could see it being this guy or that guy, but that it's a long way off. Mm-hmm. I look at them now and, and I see kids that they have developed. I think Ray Davis uh, is going to be one of the better running backs in the league if they can open any kind of holes for him. Uh, if you're doing SEC fantasy football, and he's around seventh, eighth, ninth round. That's one you may want to snag because I think he'll he'll do some things. Will Shepard has really started to develop after a breakout year last year. Um, you know the the quarterback room. AJ Swan I think is their quarterback of the future. Maybe their quarterback by the end of the season. He's going to throw a lot of picks when he plays, but I'm not kidding when I say I think he's got arm strength that rivals Jay Cutler. Um, and you don't see that every day. Um, And and that's, I'm not joking about it. He's got a howitzer for an arm. Um, Defensively, Anthony Orgy has been on a lot of OSEC teams. He's going to be, it's going to be hard for them to get him off the field. Uh, They've got Ethan Barr. They've got Kane Patterson, who who played some at Clemson, going to be in a timeshare at the other spot. They've got a kid named Jalen Mahoney starting safety to Ricky Wright, who is probably the best athlete on the team, but, They needed to find a place for him to play. Uh, Look, this isn't going to be a team that you're going to go up at the end of the year and and says, you say, well, they've got, you know, half a dozen kids that made all SEC at some level. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when you start looking at kids that have got ability, uh, they've done a much better job of recruiting and developing those kids. And I, I think you're starting to see that pop a little bit on the field. And, and another thing I, you've referenced on your show is just, uh, you know, the effort and the gang tackling. I mean, it's hard to even tell who's making these tackles because they're, they're all yeah. swarming to the ball. Is, is this much closer to what Clark Lee envisions for his Vanderbilt defense? You think we'll see that this fall? 
Yeah, I, I don't know that Vanderbilt is going to be the team that you say, man, we we, we don't want to play them. Um, you know, when you look across the SEC, but what they want to be is a team that when you're done playing them, going, man, I don't want to do that again. Um, they 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 want their identity to be swarming to the ball and getting a half dozen or more guys in in a pile up, uh, and they really did a good job of that. So I think they are going to be a team this year, based on what I've seen, that when you play them, they'll hit you. Uh, they'll be very aggressive and going to the ball, and and, and it won't be may, maybe the cakewalk in that sense that it's been in the past. Again, I, I think they're they're going to be hard pressed to win an SEC game, but I think some teams will will maybe be feeling it the next day a little more than they have in the past. Uh, hey, that being said, all the positives. What? How big of a loss is it losing uh, Miles Capers for the season? I think it's a loss. Um, they don't have a pass rusher that I can name that's a huge threat. I think they're going to have to get it from safety blitzes, corner blitzes, uh, you know, sending a linebacker through a gap, that kind of thing. But Capers was a kid who was maybe their best threat as a pass rusher. He was in good shape. Uh, he's, he's a rangy kid. He plays that star position, which is the hybrid linebacker defensive end. Um, he started basically from day one of fall camp on and had not lost that job. So they're thin there right now. They're probably going to have to play a freshman or two. Um, and, and I think that was a pretty significant loss. It's not a, a crushing loss, but certainly he was the best option at that spot. Now, Chris, I, I value your opinion much more than Dari Noka. And it, hey, Dari Noka <laughs> does a great, great job. I'm not trying to down him but I'm, I'm talking specifically Vanderbilt here and I'm sure you've seen it he's come out here and said hey 4-0 start for the Vanderbilt Commodores do you just kind of roll your eyes at that or do you or you are you believing that hey if things break right maybe uh the Commodores could be 4-0 to start the year well that, let's be clear that that's a limb I won't go out on I, I don't think they're going to be 4-0 but it's not as crazy as it was a month or two ago and, and there's two reasons for that and again I can think when I, when I see them with my eyes they're an improved football team um number two I think that weight game is key Sam Hartman mm -hmm. I think there's a good chance he's going to be out in that game uh I don't know if it'll it, it could break the other way but from what I'm hearing uh, the issue he's got is going to sideline him for about a month. And I don't know if that's a month from when they diagnosed it um, or, you know, uh, a month of the season. But if Wake doesn't have Sam Hartman, I don't think Vanderbilt's overmatched athletically in that game like it's going to be in SEC games for the most part. So I think they get Hawaii. I think they get Elon. And if they don't, they're in trouble. But you could be 2-0 and playing Wake Forest. Uh, without its quarterback, maybe you've got a little confidence. Maybe you're not overwhelmed. I, I still think Wake wins that game with or without Hartman, but it's more interesting. Then if you win that, no reason you can't go to Northern Illinois the next week and win. That That's not going to be a hostile environment. I was actually in that stadium last year watching my nephew play at Wyoming, so I, I know that it's not going to be an intimidating place at all. Mm -hmm. um, that, that Look, that's a lot of ifs there, but it's not – and I still wouldn't go there, but it's not as crazy it was maybe a couple of months ago. And I'm sure you've seen this as well, but SEC Nation, they've already announced, hey, we're going to be at the Vanderbilt-Wake Forest game. And are you aware of anything that Vanderbilt is going to try to do to to kind of just just raise the energy or make that a, a game to to try to get as many fans as possible to come out? No, um, not aware of anything yet. Of course, that just got announced a day or two ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know what their plans are going to be. Look, they've got to get fans in that stadium, period. Their, their season ticket base is – I'm going to guess they don't announce it, but I think it's under 8,000. Um, th that's a time that if you win a couple games, and I think that's crucial, maybe you can start selling some enthusiasm there. Uh, but I, I don't know what they're going to do for that. But that's certainly – they're going to have to start marketing the program better building their season ticket base because that's a chance to 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 maybe get yourself on the radar radar a little bit if you can go to an O into that game and, and and play it well or maybe win. Now on the latest Vandy Sports podcast you talked about this game and, and whether it is a must win the opener against Hawaii. Can you kind of uh, share your thoughts on, on just the the level of importance this game for Vanderbilt this fall? Mike, I think it's really important because you look at the schedule and I don't see an SEC game that they win. Now, Missouri might be the one they've got a chance at, uh, given the way they played it a year ago, um, given that Missouri is probably the weakest team in the SEC besides them. 
Uh, but there's still a gap between them and Missouri. Hawaii just got decimated. I mean, that was a circus uh, involving state legislatures, involving Twitter wars, involving, what, 53 players lost to the portal or whatever it was. I mean, it was really <laughs> ugly there. And you start looking at, you know, we talked about the, the bad shape that Vanderbilt was in. Uh, Hawaii's going, hey, hold my beer here. Um, <laughs> you know, they still got an or situation with three quarterbacks. They do have a couple of offensive linemen who come back and a decent running back, but the receivers have done almost nothing. I think they lost their last – their the top eight or nine tacklers. Um, it's a bad spot to be in. I don't, I don't care if you play in Hawaii or Vandy or on the moon. That's one game that Vanderbilt should win. And if they don't win, then the implication is who can they beat, right? Yeah. Um, you would think Elon the next week, but they lost to – an FCS team a year ago. So I, I think it's very important because I think if if they don't win, then you get all, all that negativity and those things that they're trying to get out of the program creep back in. And I, I think it creates some doubt as to whether Clark's the right guy. Maybe that's not fair at this point, but again, I look at that and go, man, if you can't beat Hawaii, it's going to be hard to see a lot of wins this season. So I got to ask, uh, what's your prediction for the game? And and just so we don't spoil anything for your audience, we're, we're going to hold this till Friday. So I'm sure you'll be publicly uh, revealing your selection by then. But who wins in the opener, Vanderbilt or Hawaii? Yeah, I, I put this out there last week. I'm I'm going Vandy 37 to 23. I think the spread has gone from six and a half to eight and a half. And again, as, as you look into Hawaii and, and look, God knows, you cannot put it past Vanderbilt to lay an egg in a spot like this. So this is not a, a take it to the bank, but just looking at it objectively where they've made improvements and they've just got so much more returning experience and production than Hawaii does. Yes. Hawaii went to the portal and got some kids, but they weren't kids that were making big splashes at power five schools for the most part. Um, I, I think Vandy should win and, and frankly um, probably should win by double digits. Hmm. Uh, last thing for you, Chris, uh, this week zero game, would you favor Vanderbilt playing it in, in this style every year? I mean, I, obviously they're not going to play Hawaii every year, but in my opinion, I think Vanderbilt, they could obviously use as much coverage as they can get. And, you know, when you play week one, you just kind of get lost in the shuffle. If I'm Vanderbilt, I'm pushing, hey, there's only two or three watchable games this weekend. Put me on mm -hmm. that week. What are your thoughts on that? Mike, I think that's a great idea, uh, and, and there's a bunch of reasons. One is what you just mentioned. Um, the other thing is this. Who's the only SEC team with two bye weeks this year? It's Fandy. Um, you know, as, as beat up as they get in the season, as much as they need rest, it gives them that. Now, the other thing it gives them, and you can only do this with Hawaii, is it gives you an option for a 13th game. I don't know if they tried to schedule that and just couldn't find a layup that they needed. I think – just getting an opportunity to beat somebody, maybe a lower level Mac team would have been a great idea, but for whatever reason, they didn't do it. Yeah. I like it because it gives them some focus on their program. It gives them in this sense, a, a shot to, to get off to a good start and it gives them some rest on the back end. So I, I say if I'm them, I, I go for it and do it again if I can. Well, I can't thank you enough, Chris. This was outstanding information. Can you tell the audience where to follow all your work and follow all everything you're doing covering the Vanderbilt Commodores? Yeah, our website is, is vandysports.com. We've got a podcast that's been around for, goodness, this is our eighth season. It's <laughs> the Vandy Sports Podcast. Uh, I've got some good guests. Will Purdue, uh, the former SEC Player of the Year and basketball co-host with me sometime. Corey Chavis, you know that name. Uh, he played corner at Vandy. He played in the NFL for a decade. He's done a ton of NFL draft work. Corey co-hosts some with me during the football season, too. Looking forward to having him back on. So if you like Vandy, uh, we, we we break it down. We we don't pull a lot of punches, good or bad. And, and I've got two guys that are names people know on with me. So I think uh, if you're looking for some info on the Commodores, uh, I think you'll like what we give.